like that. It's really more about um, just designing that way because design, good design is green design, sustainable design. So very rarely did I ask clients, do you want a green building or not? No, I just went ahead and designed it that way. And so of course, when we started um, creating the Phoenix home, uh, that was a big, big part of it. Um, and another key portion is that since we're serving fire survivors, um, I'm, I'm trained in trauma-informed care. I'm a, I'm a certified um, crisis intervention worker in the state of California. I, I, I've, for a number of years, I've been doing volunteer work with victims of violent crime. And so I'm trained to recognize trauma and people who have been, um, who have lost their homes, who are fire survivors, they are definitely traumatized. And so a part of what we were, our goal was to make the process more um, easy to navigate for traumatized fire survivors. And just, you know, looking at it in that lens as well, gave us a better building. And I, I can talk about that a little later on. Um, my partner and co-founder is Tony Penna. He's president of Penna Construction. And, you know, he was one of the early adopters for insulated concrete forms, you know, more than 25 years ago. He's the leading ICF contractor in California. He's really well known um, across the country. And we've been designing and building homes together uh, for about 10 years. Um, and uh, his company is a third generation concrete company in Orange County. So uh, the, the two of us together bring you know, and, and a couple of other um, on our team, uh, we bring a wealth of knowledge and experience on all sides of the design build equation. Oops, okay. So let me, uh, not really sure what happened there. Okay. Sorry about that. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm here today to talk about net, net zero energy. And I've been concerned because as we've been out there talking about Phoenix, uh, Phoenix home is a net zero energy home. And a lot of times when we go somewhere and somebody else says, oh, we're doing that too, or we have net zero home or we're, you know, and I'm starting to hear it more and more often. And it's kind of like the Wild West because there is really no official certification or, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard and it's rare. Um, the government really doesn't do it. So, um, you know, everybody's just kind of on their own here to define it as they will. Um, so out of all of these certifications, I mean, you see that there's one um, with the department, the U.S. Department of Energy. You're probably familiar with the HERS rating index. Um, now, if you look at that little graphic there, you'll see that the copyright on it is 2013, 10 years, it's 10 years old. And I just got that from their website. I mean, this is recent, current, this is on their website right now. Uh, so I can pretty much guarantee you that 10 years ago, whatever we were talking about with net zero energy is not what we're talking about today. Um, and, you know, most of these rating systems are voluntary. It's about um, kind of signing a piece of paper saying, okay, I promise to do X, Y, Z, or it's a design model, or, you know, it's just, it's using baselines, uh, kind of arbitrary baselines, instead of really looking at what the home is actually, how the home is actually performing. And so out of all of these certifications, there's only two that um, are really true certifications. And there's only one that, in my opinion, is truly net zero energy. Um, and so the International Living Future Institute is the only certification in the world that actually prohibits combustion fuels, you know, greenhouse gas generating fuels. It requires battery storage. And it also requires one full year of operational verification. So it's not enough to just say, oh yeah, we're gonna do it, I promise. 
uh, they, they want to see the evidence that your home or your building is truly performing net zero. Um, if we look back at the, um, the LEED zero certification, um, I would say that comes in second. Uh, one of the drawbacks is that it's not a standalone certification. You have to actually have a LEED certification, certified building, and the LEED zero is like an add-on certification. So that makes it very expensive. Um, this, the ILFI certification is about $3,000 for a home, but LEED certification for a building, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars when all is said and done. Um, and also interestingly, the LEED zero um, certification does not prohibit fossil fuels. Um, it allows for credits um, and it, I don't believe it requires battery storage either. So it's really not what I would consider true net zero energy. Um, so this, this is all there is. And so if you, if you see this certification on a building, I would trust it. I would trust it, but that's it. Anything else, it's really just, you know, marketing and uh, yay for us kind of, kind of thing. Now in California, we really don't see a lot of those certifications very often because we have a really good green building code. We have probably the best, if not only green building code in the world. And um, you might hear people call it Title 24. Um, actually, that's a bit of a misnomer because uh, the California Building Standards Code in its entirety is Title 24. The energy code portion is part six, but we just call it Title 24. It's, you know, slang, you know, jargon. Uh, it's just easier to, um, to talk about. Um, so when you get this, you know, total energy design rating of zero, that is net zero. That's net zero. And um, so the nice thing about Title 24 is that it's just part of the standard building plan check and permitting process. So obviously it's not free, <laughs> but if you are building a building, you're gonna have to do Title 24 um, calculations and do a Title 24 report. Um, Hearst rating is a required part of the Title 24 um, code plan check, code compliance system. So we are way, way, way ahead we're much further ahead than any other state in the nation as far as energy code goes. So that's why we just don't really see a lot of these certifications here in this state because our code is already really stringent. Um, however, it does allow for natural gas fueled appliances. Um, basically you have to take all the BTUs uh, that are being you know, utilized by gas, add that to your, your power consumption and size your solar panels for, um, to, uh, to accommodate that consumption of the gas. Uh, so if you do that, and there's a few other things that you have to do, you can get to that EDR of zero, um, even if you have natural gas fired appliances. And so, you know, what does it mean anyways to be net zero energy? Um, a building is net zero energy when it generates all of its required energy on site from renewable sources and, 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 and draws zero energy from the utility provider. So, so that part is really key. If, if, if your building is pulling power off the grid then you're not truly net zero. No fossil fuels, okay? No gas stoves, no gas water heaters, no gas generators. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, I don't know if I have to, I mean, just really quickly, um, we, we don't wanna burn fossil fuels anymore. It, it creates greenhouse gases, it, it creates CO2 emissions, and we want to get away from that. So the way we're gonna cut our greenhouse gas emissions is by electrifying buildings as much as possible and powering that electricity with green renewable energy. Um, 
And so you must have adequate battery storage for all power needs so that you're not, you know, so that when you're generating power, you're not, you're probably not using it. You know, you're, 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 you might be at work, your kids are probably at school when your, your panels are operating at, at full capacity. And so everybody comes home and you've sent all that power back to the grid. So now you're drawing power off the grid. Um, and I'm going to get a little more into that in, in, a, in the next slide. But um, so that's where we start leaving the net zero, even though you might be getting credits and stuff. Um, technically, you're really not operating net zero. And so, like I was saying, net metering or, or credits doesn't cut it. And I'll explain, I'll explain why, you know, what? No met net metering. You know, so many people, I mean, the vast majority of people that have almost probably everybody that have solar uh, solar panels on their on their home, they count on that net metering because they don't have battery storage. So um, even though you've got enough panels that are generating power for enough of your house, um, if you're net metering, you're not net zero. And so the CPUC knows this, and so does PG&E, SDG&E, and SoCal Edison. And um, you may know this, you may not, but there, have been, there are now new tariffs for those customers that are reducing the value of your credits by as much as 75%. Now, if you already have a solar installation on your home, you're grandfathered in, you're fine. If you've already purchased, you know, you could have, you know, so this went into effect last week, April 14th. Um, if you purchased, um, a, a solar installation prior to April 14th, and there were a couple other milestones that you needed to hit before that date, you're good. You're grandfathered in, you've got three years to, um, to install your solar. But if you have not purchased solar and you, you haven't done it yet, then you're gonna be under this new regime, net, net energy meter, metering 3.0. So here's the thing, utilities are now gonna be charging you to send power back to the grid during peak hours. So, uh, and the reason they're doing this is because like I was saying, you know, there's, there's a surplus in California of solar energy, of renewable energy. We're, we're generating a lot of, of renewable energy. That's not the problem. The problem is it's being generated all at the same time, and it's at the time of day when we're not really using it. So what happens is everybody comes home from school and work, and they turn on their computers and their TVs, and you know they uh, they turn on their lights and their air conditioning and all that stuff. And so the the utilities are like, whoa, 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 <laughs> you know we don't have any power. And so what happens is that they start having to draw power from dirty sources because they don't have enough renewable generated power. They're just not, you know, so, so they've got to pull it from coal and, and all the other stuff and gas that we're trying to avoid. So, so that's why we're changing to net energy metering 3.0. And guess what? If you keep your energy on site and you have adequate battery backup, battery storage, you, you're fine. You're, you're not gonna be affected by this because you're not gonna be sending that power back to the grid. You know, a lot of times people are like, well, you know, big deal buildings, you know, Ugh, our, our big problem is, is cars and trucks, you know, that, that's our real problem. And no, I mean, yes, obviously transportation is a huge, huge portion of greenhouse gas emissions and so is industry. But look at buildings, it's buildings that, that make up almost half of all greenhouse gas CO2 emissions. Now, some of that is construction and industries that support construction, but a lot of it is building operation, the buildings themselves and the energy that they consume. And so, you know, I'm sure there's some of you that are familiar with budgets, cutting budgets, you know, and when you need to cut a budget, you don't start with that little bitty line item, you know, on the bottom, right? 
you want to start with the big kahuna, the big guns right at the top that, you know, because that's where you make the biggest difference. So with buildings as being one of the largest CO2 emissions contributors, if we start cutting what buildings add to the equation, we can make a really big dent in our greenhouse gas, um, global warming climate change across the board. Um, and residential buildings are big energy consumers. There, as you can see, these graphics appeared in the New York Times just last week. Um, I, I think it's no coincidence that it was April 14th. It was the same day that NEM 3.0 took effect. Uh, so, you know, the graphic on the left is how Americans are using energy today. So it's a really good overview of where all of our energy is, is being consumed. Um, and so please note too that um, industrial, I, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, there's construction and all these construction processes that are included in industrial, okay? So, so we've got residential and commercial that, that obviously are, are buildings, and then you throw in the, the construction stuff, and that, that's what starts making up a big chunk of our CO2. Um, and so uh, the graphic on the right, all of a sudden you see how much of that comes from electricity. Not a lot, not a lot, um, especially in transportation, but um, there's a lot of improvement to be made in residential. So the graphic on the left, well, both of these graphics are depictions of, you know, a net zero pathway by 2015, where we want to be. And I think you'll see also that notice less energy use in 2050. Okay, that's really important because conservation is still a really critical element to net zero energy. Because, you know, people think sometimes that, oh, you know, I'm gonna have solar panels on my house so I can, you know, gobble up all of this electricity and be really super inefficient. It doesn't matter because I've, I've got solar panels. Well, yes, it does matter because we're still not gonna be to the point where we can physically be disconnected from the grid. You, you really aren't gonna want that because you never know um, solar arrays can malfunction in emergencies, um, whatever, you know, it's, we still need to have that grid connection. And um, in order, if, if you're gonna be using a lot of power, well, guess what? You need to have that connection to the grid be able to accommodate all that power. So that means our infrastructure costs go up. So, so the more power we're consuming, regardless of where it comes from, regardless of how it's generated, increases the need for larger infrastructure that can handle the larger power. So conservation is always going to be important, always. We should always be striving on the conservation side just as hard as we are on the renewable generation side. Those, those those two sides of the equation go hand in hand. And so how do we do this? Um, luckily, someone has figured it out. We have. <laughs> um, you know, net zero challenges with, uh, there, there's a lot of challenges with traditional home construction. Uh, we, we build homes the way we've been building them for the past hundred, I mean, hundreds of years. And we don't build them that way because it's the best way to do it. We build that way because we've always built that way. And that's got to change. In order to move to a net zero energy environment, we cannot keep building wood homes the way we build them. So, you know, wood construction is very complicated. It involves a lot of spe very specific detailed design. Um, it's, it's very hard to, to, you know, you have to build the same home over and over and over again in order to, to make it possible to build a lot of homes. And then it burns, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and the wood itself, 
uh, rots and it decays and it warps and it cracks. Um, and it, it it's not, you know, the way wood stud walls work and wood roof, roofs work, it does not give us enough room to put the insulation in there that we need. You know, even if you go to a two by six wall, you're still not gonna have enough width in that wall to get the insulation that you need to be, to, to get that energy consumption down, the conservation aspect of it. And we need exterior rigid insulation on the walls and on the roof. With, with framing, whether it's steel or wood, it makes it very, very difficult to, it, it's, it's really tough to put, you know, four inches of rigid insulation on the exterior of your home because it, it screws up all the cladding, the way the cladding attaches. And, you know, we've got sheathing and seismic stuff. The roof especially gets very complicated. Um, and if you don't have exterior rigid insulation or some kind of insulation on the exterior, it, it's typically rigid, you're gonna have thermal bridging. So it doesn't matter how much insulation, cavity insulation you have in the wall. If you have studs that touch the exterior cladding and touch the interior drywall, you're gonna have thermal bridging from the exterior to the interior. So your wall is gonna get hot in the summer and cold in the winter. And again, it doesn't matter how much insulation you have in that cavity. So you're going to be losing energy through the contact of having those studs touching those surfaces. Another um, obstacle is that the vast majority of contractors do not have experience installing the latest technology in electric appliances, heat pumps, et cetera. Um, when we're talking about going all electric, we're not talking about resistance you know, coil heating, stuff like that. You know, this is not the electric space heater, radiator. This is not the electric stove. This is not the point of use electric water heater or, an, you know, and a tank electric heater. Um, that is really inefficient, actually. Um, the, it, it takes a lot of energy via electric, electrical resistance to heat anything, whether it's air or water and you wind up losing a lot of energy in the resistance in, in the resistance coil itself. So it's incredibly inefficient. We would not be talking about building electrification if we still were relying on that technology. Um, it's just not possible. So once we started moving more into heat pump technology, now we have heat pump water heaters, we have heat pump clothes dryers, we have induction ranges, which are awesome. Um, and so, you know, and, and our heat pump mini split systems, I mean, they've been in use worldwide for 30, 40 years, but in the United States, uh, that, that technology is starting to become a little more common, but th the knowledge still isn't there, the on-site expertise. So, so that really puts up some challenges to, um, to going all electric in our buildings. There's also this negative public perception of electric versus gas. And I'm sure there's some of you that are like, oh, you know, I, I need my gas Viking range. I couldn't imagine doing without it. Well, um, let me tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm a cook and um, I love induction. I like it better than gas. And it's just gonna take time. You know, the, uh, you, you've got a friend that comes over, your family members come over and, you know, your aunt, you know, decides she's going to make a meal. She's going to cook on your induction cooktop. Oh my God, you know, this, this is actually pretty great. You know, it's just going to take time for people to get used to it. Um, you know, but I'm here to tell you that these new um, technologies really are pretty cool. And you know we've got the codes. I mean, even Title 24 is not fully caught up to the challenges of an all electric building. I mean, with, with our first Phoenix home, um, we had to run the Title 24 calcs like four times. And the, the consultant kept coming back saying, you're not complying. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, 
you're kidding me. We have R30 walls. We have an R32 roof. Um, you know, we have all electric appliances. You cannot tell me. You know, we have a 10 kWh, uh, 10, 10 kW solar array. We've got batteries. You know, it's like, how can you tell me that we don't comply? And, you know, it was because everything's written for the wood home. Everything's written for, you know, electrical resistance, water heating and things like that. So it hadn't been updated for heat pump technology yet. So I think that's changed with the latest code update, but it's still designed for wood buildings and wood framing. So, so we still have to kind of adjust our, um, you know, our consultant has to tweak um, the Title 24 calculations in order to get, get us to, you know, even comply. And then once she's done, then we get the EDR of zero. So, so that's how ironic this is, but um, you know, this is new. And so we're, we're not really going to figure everything out right off the bat. It, 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 it is going to take time. And so just a little bit, you know, explaining what Phoenix actually is, what the Phoenix Home is. Uh, these are our principles, the four Phoenix pillars, um, fire resistance, climate resilience, design excellence, and transparency. And again, this all arose out of serving fire survivors, the desire to help these people that have been through the most traumatic experience of their lives, usually. Um, they're deer in the headlights. They aren't comprehending things. You know, they're not really hearing what you're saying. And so, you know, building a home is very, very complicated and it's not for everybody to begin with. I mean, only a small fraction of people actually wind up designing and building their own home. It's, it's, it's a big challenge. And so think of having to go through, you know, a number of years making all of these major decisions that cost hundreds, if not millions of dollars, and you've been traumatized and you're not processing, you know, you're not listening so we just we we realized we needed to streamline the process, make it easier to navigate, more predictable, easier to understand, so that these folks can follow along. And of course, the, what was the first thing that they asked for? We don't want our home to burn again. We don't want to have to go through this again. It was a nightmare. So that was the first thing that we had to do was figure out how to make this, how to get all the wood out of this house and what is the best. And so, you know, type 1A is the most non-combustible um, structure you can build per code. Um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but I mean, a little bit later, I'm almost done here, but. Uh, and, and so it just kind of happened naturally that, you know, I call it kind of the, the sweet spot in design. When you're, when you're making the right decisions, the design just kind of starts designing itself, you know, and it, you solve one problem and then it winds up solving all these other problems. And, you know, you're like, oh, wow, that's super cool. And so all of the things that we were doing to make it fire resistant also wound up being great for for sustainability. And it, it was very easy to make this a net zero energy building, very easy. Um, you can see we use up to 80% less construction waste. Um, we're off, we're, we're independent of the grid. I mean, we still, in, in the vast majority of areas in the state of California, code requires that you still be connected to the grid. There's, there's cert, only certain circumstances in certain jurisdictions where it doesn't, they, we, you're not required to actually hook up to the grid. But nine times out of 10, you are going to have to hook up to the grid. So you're still hooked up to the grid, but you're not using the power. You're not drawing the power from the grid. Um, so how is Phoenix different from the traditional way, the old way? So like I was saying that, you know, we're type 1A non-combustible construction in the building code. There are five types of construction ranging from, you know, type one and two, which are the two that are non-combustible, no wood allowed to type five, type five being the most combustible. And 
just about every single home in the United States is permitted as a type five structure. Even homes that have burned and they get built back, they're built back as type five. Even ICF homes, insulated concrete form homes, if they're not permitted as a type 1A structure, an ICF home will be permitted as a type five, no different than a wood frame structure, no different. And your typical ICF home is going to have a wood framed roof. So you're still gonna run into the same problems with regards to fire resistance and with regards to um, insulation as you would with a wood framed home. There's, there's literally no difference. So, um, you know, type 1A is basically what we build towers, you know, high rise towers out of um, hazardous facilities, you know, fireworks factories, you know, ammunition depots, things like that. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's literally a bunker, you know? And so we're the only ones in the nation that actually figured out how to do this and make it affordable. So obviously, like I was saying, we have battery backup um, and I prefer actually to say storage. Um, it's more accurate. Um, backup makes it sound like, oh, if the power goes out, you're gonna be operating off the battery. No, no, you're, the battery storage is an integral part of your photovoltaic system. It's, it's two parts and they're, they're both equally important. Um, we're all electric um, and we are able to reduce our construction waste so significantly because we use a collection of various proprietary systems. We're not modular, we're not a manufactured home by any stretch of the imagination. We are a custom designed site built home. It's just that we have hand selected the best of the best. So, you know, there's a company that, that engineers our floor, you know, our horizontal assemblies. There's a company that engineers and builds our stairs. Um, you know, we have all of these different systems. And so a lot of these systems are engineered and built off site. Our stairs are built off site and shipped to the site and they're put together in like less than a week. So we don't have any waste as far as that goes. And that's also what allows us to build the home so quickly. Uh, so like I say, you know, more than two years to design and build a typical home with us, we can design and build it in less than 18 months. Our first home uh, was, built in, was built in less than 11 months. And that was during COVID, during all the supply chain, now foos and all those problems. Um, it, you know, we were really proud of ourselves and our first home won an award right out of the gate. So, um, so that, you know, we're, we're on our way here. Um, like I said, you know, the streamlined trauma informed process is not only helpful to fire survivors, but also in general, it makes the whole process easier for anybody, you know, kind of like universal design, you know, uh, a lot of people want roll in showers and grab bars. Well, you know, you don't have to be, you know, disabled or elderly in order to appreciate a roll in shower and a grab bar. Everybody might need it every now and then, right? So, so it's kind of the same thinking with the trauma informed design process is that you don't have to be traumatized in order to really appreciate it and be like, wow, this is, this is a great process. Um, and the maintenance costs obviously are hugely reduced. Um, we don't need to, you'll never need to paint the exterior. There's no rot, no pests, no bugs, you know? So, uh, and obviously being net zero energy, your energy bill is gonna be close to zero. So we still have a long way to go but we do know how to get there. It, um, it, it just takes the political will. We just need to decide that this is what we wanna do. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess I can take, uh, I can take questions now. Um, here's my um, contact information. Feel free to visit our website and, um, you know, feel free to email me if you have any questions, but um, I'll, hand it back to Sophia and see if we have uh, any questions.
Does anyone have any questions? If not, then I will. Um, yes. Sophia. Uh, Hello. This is Michele. Uh -huh. Hey, Michele. Hey, how are you doing, uh, Lori? I'm Thank good. You, I'm good. Uh, how are you? For being here. I'm sorry that I had to miss uh, half of uh, your presentation, uh, but I was uh, jumping from meeting to meeting. Uh, I wanted, first of all, uh, to thank you for being uh, here uh, and presenting uh, this very interesting work uh, that uh, that your company uh, is doing, uh, very needed. Uh, um, uh, what I wanted uh, to ask is something that is uh, uh, kind of beyond just the individual building, uh, but uh, um, it's uh, part uh, of how we really defend the, the communities from wildfires. Um, how do you connect uh, your uh, uh, system to the global grid? And uh, um, have you thought about uh, um, uh, microgrids uh, for uh, uh, communities that want to kind of get uh, insulated beyond the individual building uh, from uh, uh, public safety power shutoffs and these kind of things? So uh, is there uh, any system to go beyond uh, leaving everybody to their own with their house uh, and uh, actually reacting as... Uh, the societal uh, animal that uh, humans uh, are supposed to be? Well, um, I, not currently, um, and but that's what I would like to see moving forward. I am not a fan of for-profit utilities. I, I, I do not think that, um, you know, people should be subject to for-profit enterprises for things that are as critical as energy. So, but that's not gonna change anytime soon. I mean, I, I think we all have to be realistic that that's the model that we have and, and we have to work within that. On the other hand, I think that, you know, the community generation um, plan, you know, a lot, San Diego is talking, is, I mean, we, we do have this sort of community generation thing going on. Um, I don't really, see a lot of movement in that yet, but um, at least it's a step. And I think that it could, I could see a situation where a community would take it upon itself to say, hey, we're going to create our own little renewable power plan over here for, you know, each neighborhood. And then, you know, you can choose, do you want to, do you want to pull power off of us? Or do you want to pull power off of PG&E? And, you know, I, I, I could see something like that. You know, it's just, again, it's, it's the infrastructure. It's the infrastructure that is so costly. And, you know, stretching these lines to bring the power, you know, that's as, as long as power needs a cable to run through, that is always going to be our issue. Now, I would say that probably even more important on the agenda than, than localized community generation is undergrounding. We need to really focus on undergrounding all of our cables and wires um, because that, that's why it's so dangerous. Um, if we've got these cables underground, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're pretty safe and it looks nicer <laughs> and we won't have, you know, all these big, um, you know, power lines and stuff shooting through, you know? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Um, I had a question actually. Yeah. Um, have you tried doing anything policy-wise to make the like stamp of approval for being zero net energy like stricter because you said that a lot of people are putting that on their homes or their building designs but they're not actually meeting that criteria and do you think that people are kind of being like misled by that mm -hmm. yeah I, I think uh you know people just don't it, it hasn't been around long enough for people to really understand what it means and even the people in the industry don't understand what it means. So um, there's a lot of education that needs to happen 
And once again, I'll say, I believe it's the role of the government because, you know, when we have a situation, I mean, a lot of those little stamps that I showed you, uh, they're for profit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're for profit. You know, hers uh, is for profit. There, there are people that make money off of doing these hers ratings. Um, the FIAS um, little certification there for passive homes, that's for profit. Um, and it's basically the, the big pitch on their website is that um, they offer an affordable way to make your, you know, to say that your home's passive, you know, and they're talking about affordable in that actual design requirements and construction requirements aren't, it, it's not, what they say is it's not going to cost you any more to create a passive home, you know, and you can get this little stamp on it. Well, I think that's a pretty tough claim to make. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially be throwing it out there like that. Uh, so, you know, it becomes just this sort of marketing gimmick, you know, and, and like, you know, the label, you get to put it on your website and you get to put it on your business card. And um, so, so like I said, it's kind of the wild west. So I, I think the government really needs to step in. I mean, the DOE, we already have net zero ready as far as a branding thing. Net zero ready is what it is. Net zero ready, it's not net zero. And it's purely voluntary. Um, Phoenix is net zero ready. And it took me five minutes to sign up. And I have like the little sign, the little logo and things. And so I haven't even put it on our website because, you know, it, it's kind of not a big deal. Um, and we're not net zero ready. We're actually net zero. So, but I think that it wouldn't be a heavy lift for the DOE to go from there to, you know, they, they energy star certify appliances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me, what, what I tell people is that we are net zero per Title 24, Part 6 of the California Building Code. Per California Energy Code, we have an energy design rating of zero. And, and that's pretty much what, what I tell people because that's the government, that's the law, that's the enforcers of the law that say this building is this. And to me, that's what, that's what carries the clout. You know, it would just be nice if maybe state of California could create like a little <laughs> cool logo, you know, that, that this is an energy design rating of zero. Um, you know, that would be neat. I'm not saying that marketing is bad you know, or not important. It's just that, um, you know, these, these ratings and certifications need to have substance. Yeah. Let's see if there's any other questions. Um, I also have another question, just more specifically, I guess, about Phoenix. Um, all right, so you guys are located in San Diego. Do you focus mostly in San Diego? And are you like planning to move farther up into like middle California, we're, North California? We're willing to go all over the state. Um, okay. We permitted a project in Tuolumne County, just outside of Yosemite. Um, we're looking at properties um, burned properties uh, just outside of Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. um, we've been contacted by folks in Santa Cruz. Um, and we currently have projects under construction in Orange County. And they will be starting construction on two homes this fall, in, one in San Diego, but also one up in, L in LA. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, uh, we're, we'll, we're ready to go all over the state. Michael? Yes. Um, a question. Uh, I know that this is kind of a general without knowing the details of a project would be difficult, but uh, um, can you comment uh, on uh, the cost per square uh, footage uh, of uh, uh, the technology that uh, Phoenix is using uh, compared with uh, a wooden uh, Chapter 7A compliant house? Well, uh, it's Per square foot costs are, you know, I actually just wrote a blog post about 
per square foot costs. <laughs> so visit, check out our blog and uh, you'll, you'll get my dissertation on, on square footage costs and um, how to be a little bit smarter about them. Uh, so, you know, with, with the Phoenix home though, what I do say is that we are no more expensive than a traditionally built home. And in some cases we could even be less expensive uh, considering that it takes about half the amount of time to deliver a Phoenix home as it is a traditional home. So you're saving, you're saving money and displacement costs. Um, and then also when, when you see what, what you get from a Phoenix home. So, you know, if, if you were to do the same, you know, get the same quality in a standard traditional wood structure as we, we offer with Phoenix, the cost of that structure would be incredibly high. With a Phoenix, you get all of that at, for the cost of a standard traditionally built structure. So, you know, and, and like any project, I mean, you know, I can, uh, oh, and by the way, we do have a cost estimator on the website. So it's, it's still pretty loosey goosey, but at least it gets people in the right frame of mind for, um, you know, so that they, you know, we, I just want people to understand right off the bat, um, if you're trying to build a home for $700,000, it's not going to happen. Just, you know, it, it's, it, the, it, it just, it's not possible. Um, so, you know, I mean, unless you're talking about, you know, a 400 square foot home or something like that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more expensive than people think. And um, so the cost estimator is kind of a good tool to kind of give you an idea of the scope of, of the size of your home. But I can, I can tell you that insurance companies, when they are looking at rebuilding homes in wood, they are very comfortable with $400 a square foot. You know, 400, 425. Uh, a typical luxury home, wood home, would run you about 500 a square foot and up. Um, whereas a Phoenix will definitely, you know, depending on what's in it, right? But um, we can we can build you a Phoenix for 375. You know, and and or even less. Um, so. You know, we are definitely in the ballpark. We do not cost any more than a traditional home costs. Um, so when you do that cost estimator on our website, realize that, <laughs> you know, if, if other builders had a cost estimator and it was real, uh, you'd be getting the same results. Um, it's not, it's, you know, don't think that, you know, oh, because it spits out 1.2 million that, oh, Phoenix is expensive. No, it's just that, that's how much a 3,000 square foot home is going to cost you, period. So. And I'm just looking at uh, your uh, blog, 